Before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge that Kogiru is located on the land of the Monica Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And since we are all joining from locations around the world, I want to acknowledge the indigenous nations where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those indigenous people are, that you find out and that you learn about them and their art and their culture as well. Without further delay, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dub Leffler. He is an illustrator, writer, animator, and mixed media artist working in the arts through books, film, television, muralism, and art education. He has taught and workshopped illustration in Australia, Scotland, Indonesia, and the United States. He is a prominent children's book illustrator and author, collaborating with Sally Morgan, Banksy, Coral Bass, and others, and is known for his soft, realistic portraits and emotional landscapes. He is descended from the Bigambul and Mondadangi people of Southwest Queensland, as well as being a French, Syrian, and Irish heritage. He lives with his daughter and his family of chickens on the central coast of New South Wales um, outside of Sydney. His award-winning bestseller book, Once There Was a Boy from 2011, received international recognition, was acquired by the Library of Congress, and was featured several times at the Bologna Children's Book Fair. More recently, he illustrated Sorry Day from 2018, written by Coral Bass, which won the 2019 Eve Pono Award for Information Books from the Children's Book Council of Australia. Black Cockatoo from 2018, which he illustrated, was also an honor book that year. At last count, he has created 25 books. So join me in warmly welcoming Dub Leffler to share his work with us today. Welcome. Hi, how are you? How are we all? Uh, this is uh, this is an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting event, isn't it? Um, now, uh, so before before we get into um, the fun stuff, we do the serious stuff, um, and we acknowledge uh, the country that uh, we're on. Almost, I'm on. Um, uh, Garingai country, it's actually um, the custodians now are the Darkenjung people. Um, and also uh, acknowledge uh, my mob, the Bigambul people, and uh, all the mobs uh, from wherever you're viewing this. So now that that, um, so um, yeah, early life. Now, uh, this is me getting arrested by the fuzz uh, for being too damn cute. When I was little, um, I actually had blonde hair there. Uh, it's actually my brother, Marky, um, that uh, we'll get to a little bit later. Now, I, um, as you may or may not know, um, I was adopted out and um, I was adopted into this wonderful family here. So you got mum and dad. Um, I was actually looking at this <laughs> this last night and I was cracking up because even our dog is smiling for the photo. So uh, I got all my brothers there and we're a bit of a mixed bunch. Um, there's two of us that were adopted and we also have a foster brother at the back, David. And uh, mum and dad had their own, own two kids um, after we came along. Um, and they, they uh, mum and dad, uh, of um, Scottish and English and uh, German heritage, hence the last name Leffler, making me the, uh, for a while I was the only um, Aboriginal person with the last name Leffler. In the, in the entire world. Now there's two of us. Um, the other is my daughter. So we grew up in this place called Corindai. Um, and you can see on the map there, right down the bottom where it says Central Coast, that's actually where I'm speaking to you from now. And just below there is Sydney. So we're about, about five and a half hours out of Sydney now. And here's what Corindai looks like uh, when I was growing up. And uh, here's what Corindai looks like today. <laughs> so nothing, nothing has changed much in Corindai. 
um, my mother actually told me, she said, oh, Dub, we, uh, uh, everyone's really excited because we've got a subway in um, Corindai. And I was like, really? You've got a train station? She said, no, everyone's excited about sandwiches here. So there's not much that goes on there. And you can see there's a road that goes out of town and there's probably about, um, there's about 4,000 people in Corindai at the moment. Uh, but it encompasses a lot of farmland. Uh, so really in the town, it's probably only a couple of thousand. Now you can see a road going out of town up to the top right. And we actually lived outside of town at a place called Brayfield. So that's where I grew up. And uh, we spent many, t many days, uh, weekends down here. This is uh, about a K away from our house. And I actually survived. Um, I survived drowning in this river after my mother had gotten me from the hospital um, uh, in, in March in 1976. And uh, there's photos of us, you can see the bridge. We actually drove, we rode across that bridge on motorbikes from time to time. And, uh, and that, it would flood this whole bridge and the water would lick uh, at the bottom of the bridge and you can see part of it is actually made from old gates so we used to run and all sorts of things down there big goannas and um, we used to do a lot of fishing down there and and uh, run into um, eastern brown snakes which are one of the most poisonous snake in the world so yeah and I, during that time i was when i wasn't down the down the creek, running around the bush, I was drawing. So I did this when I was in what we call infant school. And uh, at, uh, you can see that we watched a lot of American TV over there. <laughs> so, um, I still have this plate. So I think it was about seven or eight, I think. So, and from there, I was about 15 when I was drawing this in high school, um, being a big Gunners fan, um, a closeted Gunners fan, because uh, everybody else was into other music. Um, and I was drawing all through high school, uh, self-portraits. Um, and this is part of a uh, my, um, Year 12, what we call, you know, it's the final year of high school, um, my major work. Uh, and I got within the top 3% of the, of the state of this artwork, which is really cool. It was six pieces, um, all hand drawn. Um, and this is actually, it's been cut. Uh, yeah. The, the principal of the school actually took it upon himself to take the artwork and pin it up in his office, but he used a uh, blue tack and, and a lot of the works got ruined. So I only have a little bit left. Um, our uh, cultural appropriation, you might say. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, a lot when uh, leading up to this talk. So when I was growing up, um, there weren't a lot of uh, books uh, on Aboriginal culture, um, something that I was uh, I, I was pining for. I wanted to learn about my roots, um, but but uh, my parents were always giving me um, books about uh, Native American people, um, uh, which I loved, and uh, I was also a big um, fan of um, Native American. Um, cinema and any film that had uh, Native American people in it, I was eating up the work because there weren't a lot of films with um, Aboriginal people in them. Uh, so, I, so uh, Native American culture became a surrogate culture for me and in my town, the Aboriginal people there were quite clicky uh, so I, I was shunned, I, I was sort of kept in the middle. Everybody knew uh, about my Aboriginal roots, and, uh, but I was on the fringe 
uh, the fringe of the fringe dwellers. So this was my, um, yeah, a connection to, to a culture. So uh, these works, this work is actually, um, my mother gets all my, she gets all the good stuff. And this is a quite a big work. I was about 18 when I did this because you could never find, um, and a lot of these are drawn from reference photos, but I just wanted books um, that were referencing uh, my own people, which was scant. So from there, I moved to Sydney, I was 19, and uh, started my first job as an animator. Now, if, um, uh, so I'm actually in the middle, there, I've got a sort of shaved head, and I've uh, I've obscured some people's faces because those people have unfortunately passed away, um, and some of those people are were about the same age. Now, what we did, um, we animated uh, these Dreamtime stories from all around Australia, and they went all around the world, and they were featured in Annecy, France, and even won some awards. And I worked on three series um, and they, they were called The Dreaming. And there were 13 episodes in each. I think there were about six um, series. So, um, and, and I started off as what, what's called an in-betweener, which is you're an assistant animator. And this is where I learned how to draw quickly. So on, on a slow day, I would draw 150 drawings. Um, and on a... Uh, a normal day, I would draw 250, 250 drawings, but I actually drew um, one day and I wanted to impress um, my boss who it looks like uh, Ned Kelly down in the bottom left there. And I drew 500 drawings in one day. So it taught me to, uh, to work beyond my means and give more than what's asked of me. Um, and so all the, all the people we were working with uh, from all different um, Aboriginal mobs from around the country uh, and it was an amazing, uh, it was an amazing time. Uh, here's some of the work actually we featured um, on Australian stamps um, and uh, I worked in all, all the different departments there um, compositing the film and this is back when everything was hand drawn and hand composited. Uh, and I also got to do backgrounds, which was amazing because we got to work with color. Uh, I actually did the, the animation on this brogue here. Uh, so yeah, a really cool time. And then after that, that, after drawing for so many, you know, and sometimes you're drawing, uh, you're working 20 hour days. Uh, 18 hour days were not uncommon. Um, I suffered burnout. And so I didn't draw for uh, about two years. I actually drew one piece of artwork, which was a. So um, I want you to remember this, this uh, picture, because it will come up a bit later. So um, during that time, I actually went searching for my biological family. Um, and we go through a, uh, a company, uh, an organisation called Link Up here in Australia, which specialises in um, finding the families of Aboriginal adoptees. So it's a great, um, a great service. Um, so I was, um, I was 25 when I found my family and they were, in Queensland, so, and here they are. So my uncle Warren uh, on the left, my grandmother, Nana Millie, who I dedicate this exhibition to, and my mother there, she's also got a petticoat underneath there. Um, so, and here she is here. She's actually featured, she features a lot in the book, Sorry Day. She's here with my cousins on the, the mission out there, out at a place called St George. Uh, I'm pretty sure. And uh, 
my aunts talk about her legs looking like two boomerangs. Um, and they're still like that. Um, and his mum, this was last year, and his mum with a beard. So mum is still quite small. She's about four, four, um, four foot. <laughs> so, you know, I'm only five, seven. So she's pretty short. And we are descended from this mop here, the Bigambul people. And this is the only photo that I have seen of um, traditional Bigambul people. And we're probably related to the little fellow that's on the, on the right there, because a lot of our family are quite small. Um, and interestingly, uh, see this is around 1900s, circa 1900s, this photo at a place called Welltown in Queensland. Um, which is traditional country for Bingo people. Um, and uh, it was one of the last corroborates there. And interestingly, my grandmother, Millie, that you saw, she actually went to the last corroboree um, of Bingo people. So, and here in the red, you can see that's where, this is basically where, um, a country lies. You can see just below the red, there's a line, a state line drawn in dotted white there. Um, we actually extend down to there just in um, where the border is. Um, so we're not quite desert, but we, we, we're getting there. So we're getting pretty close. So, and here's a, a place called Torwood, which I, I visited when, um, I um, met my, my mob, uh, so you can sort of, it gives you a sense of the country there. And it's, it's famous for um, bottle trees, the Queensland bottle tree. And they actually get quite, uh, quite big. It's a uh, Brachychiton rupestris is the Latin name. So they get fairly big, uh, beautiful trees. Uh, and here's my daughter actually hugging one. This, these are up um, only a couple of kilometres up the road from our house here in the Central Coast. Um, the narrow-leafed bottle tree. And so all this, through all this time, I was constantly moving back and forth. So from Queensland to Sydney and back again and then to Crindai. And, and this place called Tamworth, where, um, which is about an hour from Crindai. Um, it, it has the biggest country music festival in Australia, where the, the town uh, population doubles in size. So it's about 30,000, 35,000. So it's about 70,000 that it flows out to. Um, and I lived there for a while. And I actually went to art school there. So during this time, uh, I, I did an advanced diploma of art and I dabbled in all forms of art. Um, and this is the very first oil painting that I did. So the teacher got us to copy the greats. I chose Caravaggio's Narcissus. Um, and I noted in the original painting that it almost looked like uh, his reflection was um, a black man. And and I've put a subtle Aboriginal flag in the centre there, uh, putting my own spin on, on it, and uh, which is it's reminiscent of the, the original work if you look at that. So I learned a lot from this piece about um, just uh, the nature of oil paint, and uh, there's a piece in the gallery there, um, which is a combination of acrylic. Um, mixed media and oil paint, the largest work there. Um, interesting to note, one of the first, uh, one of the first oil paintings I did, because I'm a closet musician, that was my other discipline. I painted my guitar case with really thick oil paint when I lived in Sydney, and then I took it to work to show my friends, and I didn't realise that it takes months, sometimes years, to dry properly. So you can imagine when I was on a crowded bus going to work and there's people in their suits, um, beautiful <laughs> work suits and dresses, and I was going and shuffling through them and I um, put oil paint all 
over their suits and dresses. Um, and I was in big trouble when I got off the bus. Big lesson there. <laughs> um, so uh, now during that time, doing um, at art school, we did um, many different projects. And one was 100 drawings in 100 days. And of course, I was accustomed to this coming from an animation background. Uh, and uh, my, our, one of our teachers offered us, he said, I'll give anyone $50 that, that, that can do 100 drawings in 100 days. And I think I did 122. Um, but of course, at the end, uh, um, uh, I did win the $50, but he tried to renege. He said, I didn't say which currency it would be in. He was going to try and pay me in rupiah from Indonesia. Pretty funny. So, uh, so these are some of the works from those 100 drawings in 100 days. Uh, yeah, cockroaches. A lot of these things were around the flat I was living in the unit, the apartment. And uh, not only were we doing drawing, but we were dabbling in all forms of art. And this, uh, which was one of the most rewarding parts, was ceramics, where I made this um, from a mould. Uh, uh, and it's basically a puppet. Um, it actually has a handle on the back. Um, uh, I can uh, uh, actually show you. I actually have this out in the office, if you can see me at the top here. I actually have it here. Uh, it has a handle on the back. And uh, so I was often turning it into a puppet and um, you know, making, um, yeah, that was, I'm a closet puppeteer as well. So, and it's done in a glaze called Shimo glaze, um, which is a really, really cool glaze to work with if you've ever worked with ceramics. Uh, uh, also doing sculpture, which is, uh, this is prob probably about twice the size of real life in this screen. So it's only, you know, about this big. Uh, and I took the photo with a camera that I made out of a box as part of the photography section of the, um, of the course I was doing. And also photograms where we just place objects on photographic paper. This is my can opener and a, uh, a piece of glad wrap. Um, and around that time, we we're learning a lot about, um, well, we we're seeing a lot on TV about wars. And so this is just my response to war. And I just love how the, uh, the piece of glad wrap has sort of, it unfolded as I was taking the photo and just became this hand. Um, this is really cool. Uh, and I started um, because I had, um, you know, up until this point, um, like just prior to, I had not, um, I didn't know my roots, uh, but I started exploring them and I was told, um, my family said, well, you know, we don't do dots. Um, our mob is lines, we do lines. So this is uh, fairly prolific here. And I don't do these often. This work is actually um, uh, displayed here in our house and it's mixed media. Um, uh, and it's about the death of my brother, bless his soul. Um, so it's quite raised. All the white lines there, they're raised, and I've painted it with glow in the dark paint. So at night time, you just see the lines. Also, sculpture. So this is out of uh, uh, a material called Hebel. Hebel block. It's it's very it's aerated cement. So hopefully everyone is still awake there. Um, so these are around Tamworth. This is a place called Bendemeer. It's a river 
and you can see uh, the teacher took us all down there and we're creating art in the landscape and these are all ochres and it was a kangaroo trap because lots of kangaroos were cruising around the sand um, and and I so I made this trap for them where I would just be able to track them and we came back the next day and uh, one of the big kangaroos had come through and sniffed at the paint and uh, you could see where he put his nose um, in there. And one of the other students, you can see the lines in the river there, they'd actually grabbed sand and just thrown them into the river. Really cool, uh, some ephemeral artwork. So yeah, and all this, all this was, you know, it was a really productive time. Uh, this is a portrait of a, um, it's done in charcoal of an artist called Norman Lindsay, um, who I found out that did a lot of racist cartoons. I, I had no idea. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, he talked about the yellow peril and also about the Germans and did quite a few works um, depicting Aboriginal people in a negative light. This is a portrait of my mother-in-law. <laughs> okay. I, I use this in schools. Um, uh, this uh, is just acrylic on board. Now this is, the reason her face is blue is because it's an old palette and there's all, um, wet oil paint underneath the surface of it blue and it's turned her face blue so I kept it, kept that going. Now this, uh, this work uh, is portraying the Aboriginal hero, a real, a real person, uh, Pemulwuy, you may or may not know, who was um, fighting the British. Um, he was, he was using guerrilla tactics and using short spears. He was, um, uh, at one point he was shot eight times by muskets and um, handcuffed and shackled um, and kept in a hut under a locked guard and he still escaped and I don't know how he did. Some people say he shapeshifted into a black cockatoo and that was his other name. Um, and these were taken, we actually did a stu student film in TAFE as part of the film aspect. Um, and so we got to work on that nice painting from uh, stills from the film, and this be, this was entered into the state um, the state TAFE awards, which TAFE here in Australia is is like community college in the states. So um, and, and uh, yeah, so it got long listed. Um, now then, unfortunately, when we moved house from Sydney to here to the Central Coast, the painting went missing. So it's gone somewhere. And, uh, and I pine for this painting because um, it was one of my favourites. It was in oil, oil paint and, and some, uh, and some acrylic underneath. This, this is another in the series, and this is called "Give Back My Head." Um, give me my head back, because um, when Pemoy was uh, finally killed, they severed his head. And they displayed it on um, uh, London, London Bridge at the top there. Uh, so it's still over there in, um, in London. Um, so yeah, his head has never been returned. And this is the first painting I ever sold, which is amazing. And it's um, in private collection in Sydney. It's quite a large piece and it also featured on a law journal on the cover in acrylic and uh, actually it's all, all acrylic. Yeah. And uh, so this one is, is on, uh, on display at the Kluge Roo uh, in person there. And that's actually me there on the right. I played, um, that's my friend Georgie who sadly passed away on the left there. Um, and we played spirits and we were um, healing Pemoy in this scene. 
and I'm getting paint to um, impersonate itself here. So um, I'm getting the paint to just look like it's paint on the skin. And uh, I learned a lot about um, oil painting through the constantly uh, work every day um, for a couple of months, about three months, I think. So, yeah, I'm really proud of this painting. And so after that time, tell me if I move back to Sydney and uh, my uh, my mother went to a psychic um, and the psychic told her, <laughs> she said, your son, uh, this is unbeknownst to me, she said, your son is going to, uh, he's going to make a book. He's going to travel. He's going to go overseas. Uh, of course, I had no knowledge of this and I also had no knowledge of the publishing industry. And so after... Um, um, after the time I moved, I said, I'm just going to move back to Sydney. I had an inkling. I just have to go to Sydney at this time. And I went to a place called Kuru Radio. Now, Kuru is, uh, as some of you may or may not know, the yeah, um, collective term for Aboriginal people in New South Wales. And uh, I went to Kuru Radio in Sydney. Um, I had $200, a bag and a guitar. And I ran into a mate of mine and um, he said, Dubs, what are you doing in town? I said, well, I've just moved back and um, I'm actually looking for a place to stay. And he said, well, I'm looking for a flatmate. So I gave him $200 um, as my rent. I moved in that night and he was an artist. His name was Jay. And he said, Dubs, you're an, you're an artist, aren't you? You're a... You're a um, you paint? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, well, there's a, a lady that does children's books and she's coming to the house tomorrow. So I literally came to my doorstep and uh, the psychic's prophecy prediction came true. And so from there, I, this, is my, this is the very first book that I did for that company called Indie Readers. And I ended up, ended up doing six books from, for, for them. And that was my launch into the industry. So, uh, and then I moved to the other side of Australia. <laughs> I was always constantly con a nomad, constantly moving around, uh, where I became a, um, a, a, a fishmonger. Uh, and I was doing all these weird jobs around that time, being you know flagman for aeroplanes, getting sprayed with chemicals and in uh, fields and um, crop dusters, and uh, but all this time I was still illustrating books. And this is the second one that I illustrated called Firewood and Rabbits, um, where I was learning about how to portray Aboriginal people in a positive light without even having to show their, their face. Uh, so you can see here, I just wanted determination. The boy wants to get across the river. So he's hunting rabbits and you can see the rabbit running over there. So I just um, thought, oh, I just want to clench, get him to clench his fist. Um, uh, and here's the same, there's two boys. And just, because I noticed at that time, um, that there were, you know, there weren't a lot of Aboriginal people portrayed in uh, in children's books, um, and especially in positions of power. And uh, so, you know, I've got the his little brother looking up to him, and he's like, we, you know, in his mind, he's like, you know, we can do this. We can we can be on top of the world. Um, we can control the machine. So these are various books that I did at the time. Um, and I was still sort of working at my style and these are all in texture, um, you know, magic marker. And then uh, I was working with various um, publishers too. 
So this is one in New Zealand I was working for. So as I was traveling, I was always um, illustrating. And then from a fishmonger, I became a, um, a deckhand. Uh, and I was actually, uh, I was telling Lauren this story the other day where the bicentennial in Australia, um, 1988, uh, 200 years of um, occupation, settlement, invasion. Um, uh, around Sydney Harbour, a massive celebration. People were flocked to the, you know, they flocked to the shores and they were packed and they were right on the water's edge. And there's this boat called the Tribal Warrior. Um, it's a gaff rig catch, and, and until recently, it was the oldest working vessel in Australia. It has travelled around, circumnavigated Australia twice. And in the, the very first trip, um, uh, everyone, all Aboriginal mobs around the coast and some inland were invited to come and hang out in the boat and put their own mark on the boat. So it's in, adorned with all these images from all different mobs from all around Australia. Um, it's almost like a rock star of the boat world. A lot of people know this boat. Um, and so I did training on this boat and sailed. Um, we did uh, 12, 12 days out to sea where I learnt my, I got my um, second officer's um, qualifications, which is a, oh, it's a fancy term for being a deckhand. Uh, but th that time really informed my work afterwards. You can see in some of my books, once I was a boy. Um, and uh, so back to the centennial, uh, the, uh, they were trying to get the boat involved in the regatta with all these, you know, they're sailing the big tall ships around and, and doing reenactments. And they said, well, why don't you include us? And they didn't want to include this Aboriginal boat, um, but they hijacked the ceremony. So all these cannons were, were um, lined up and they let off um, all these mock cannonballs and uh, smoke filled the harbour and then out through the smoke uh, sailed the tribal warrior and it was you could hear a pin drop and then after that time oh the whole crowd you know erupted erupted and from from that year on they were invited back every year to lead the regatta such an important boat and it was an honour to actually uh, to train on that boat and uh, we sailed up the east coast of Australia right up to um, Townsville and actually went on to a place called Palm Island after that, um, which is really cool. I actually lived on the boat for, for a time too, which is really cool. So after the sail, <laughs> yeah, that's me on the left. Um, I see I moved back to Crindo. Um, I kept moving around and, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> and this happened. Um, so I really started um, concentrating on children's books and uh, this book actually changed my life because it opened the world to me um, and I was invited to many different places around the world, many different festivals, um, such as the Edinburgh Festival of the Book, which was amazing. Um, Travelled through Dublin. And uh, I was actually on this trip um, with a uh, fellow author, Bruce Pascoe, of Dark Emu fame, which is an amazing trip in itself. This is at Trinity College in Dublin. <laughs> Um, places like Melbourne Island, uh, where we did a lot of workshops there. We were there for about a week. And uh, a lot of people may know that Aboriginal people are quite shy, um, with people that don't know. But uh, on Melville, they're very, very confident people, very, very confident people. And they're a really inclusive mob. So they, you become tea where you know, they say, no, no, you with us now. They, after a time, they're very, very cool people. And these are some of the kids that we were doing workshops with. I took all these masks and um, costumes and we got to 
got the kids to play. And you can see the confidence of the kids there, you know. Yeah, and I'm making little videos of the girls here watching videos of them. We were, we were writing stories and you know, it's always about a wolf. They love the wolf mask, which I still have somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Mikey, he was a great character. He really funny and his teacher there. Uh, yeah, it was a great time. So, I, so my work has afforded me um, uh, the luxury of travelling to lots of places um, within Australia and abroad. Um, most notably, notably uh, DC, uh, and actually you can see Bruce there in the background. He's the fellow that looks like Santa Claus slash Gandalf. Um, so at the um, the, the uh, National Book Festival. Uh, this is in 2015. Is that right, Lauren? I think 2015. Yeah. Um, so where my books actually sold out, which is amazing. Um, and it's all, this is at the uh, Walter E. Convention Centre. Um, amazing. Uh, actually, it was an amazing day. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Being a tourist, we had no idea that this, um was uh, the Watergate Hotel. I had no idea. Um until we saw people taking photos. Um now this is probably one of my fondest memories here. Um when we're in DC. And it's just a photo, but um to me it really looks like an Edward Hopper painting. Uh and I just love this a story there, you know, the man on the phone, um, the American flag there. Just, and the colours is just a you know, constant uh, inspiration there. Uh, yeah, this is one of the other places I travelled to. Um, I went to practice this one. It's called Nyan Merienga. Nyan Merienga. They also call it Palampa, um, which is right up the top of Australia. Um, and uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah, Warren and some of the kids, they had to, uh, it was a, it's, we'd found a dead water python um, on the road and the kids were playing with it. Um, it was right outside. We were, we were staying, we were actually doing a, a bilingual book there and the, uh, in English and their, their local lingo called Murumpatha, which is, uh, um, it's doing the reverse of what um, most of Aboriginal languages uh, have been doing, where they, a lot of have died out and some are continuing to die out. But modern Papa is actually um, becoming the most widely spoken uh, language in the area there. And it's actually overtaking um, uh, um, other languages, which is, um, uh, they were informing me, they were informing me that that is what's been happening uh, over millennia as languages have, they, you know, as, as we know, they change um, and some become more prominent. So, and this, these are some of the images from that book called The Emu Has Big Feet. So I just compiled the book and all the, uh, and I did some of the, um, the um, compositing. So all the children did all the artwork um, there. And yes, yeah, so they have crocodiles just outside the school. There's a river there. And so when it floods in the wet season, um, school shuts because crocodiles can actually swim straight into the school. Um, and as I got to quote, go to this cool place, um, the Cleaky Roo, which is, uh, it's just amazing cruising over, um, you know, you, see, you, you can see all these beautiful rolling hills um, cruising out on Highway 66 and, and then you come to this, um, this wonderful, you know, big round driveway and then there's this uh, building with a big Aboriginal flag on it and you just go, what is this place? And uh, I was actually um, checking out the archives there. Uh, Amazing. So uh, I'll just skip through these. It's, uh, so remember this. Um, now this drawing was I was in um, 
I was asked by a German friend of mine. She said, uh, there's a competition going in uh, a place called Kassel in Germany. Um, and it's called the Password Exhibition or Password in the German. Uh, and basically it was, they, the, this, uh, they would give you, the gallery would give you a password at a certain time. And then you had two hours to do three artworks and then send them in. Um, and there, uh, you know, there, I think there were 4,000 entrants, I think, um, that entered. And uh, then they chose um, people to be in included in the exhibition. And they actually had to give me their password earlier than other countries for some reason. Uh, so, and I was, I was drawing, hurriedly drawing three drawings in two hours, and this is one of them. Um, and you can see it down the bottom left there, and I've got a write up uh, because it won the, um, it won the uh, competition. Uh, I was a co winner uh, and got 500 euros, which is really cool, really, really cool. Um, and here's some works from there in Castle. Uh, and they just printed them out and just simply hung them on the, on the wall there. So really, really cool, you know, really unexpected. Um, and the password was the work is done. So I had one of um, uh, my partner, she had just given birth to our daughter. It was a sketch of that. One of a, a drummer that had just finished recording and one of the gentleman with his head on the keyboard. Uh, yeah, so really cool. Um, another satellite project, this is in my primary school. Um, I've done some murals as uh, Lauren had mentioned before. So this is in Corindai. Uh, this is the other side where we get, uh, we got as big gowners there, we call them Yudin. And the big ones are called Yudindali or Mungungali. Um, and this was just with house paint. Um, and I was, it was just with five colours, so I mixed them actually on the, the water tank itself. And then got a write up in the local, the local newspaper, um, which is funny. Um, uh, and here's another one that I did in Queensland. It's a place called Jinjin. It's, um, well, it's, a, it's a place called Tyrone. And it's, uh, um, and I painted this with a broom and just with house paint um, when I was there. It's near, it's not far from a place called Bundaberg. And I was staying with um, one of my mother's friends up there. Yeah, I've also done sort of installation slash muralism here. This is a cement pole. And I did six of those um, for uh, a, a school called the Camaroy Steiner School. Uh, in Sydney uh, and so the local mob there they don't recognize four seasons they recognize uh, six seasons so I planted six of these cement poles um, at each different season so the uh, the tree in the background there is an angophora tree and I use that as the model and uh, and so I just um, had it as if it was it was shedding bark through the different seasons and grow, and regrowing bark, sort of like a clock. Um, oh, now this, <laughs> this fancy. I've also designed tattoos for people. You know, probably been. I, I reckon Lauren's been wondering about why this picture has been this slide. So um, now this is a local um, Gomeroy fella from my hometown in Corindai, and. Um, so I designed uh, the, the, um, the Aboriginal man there on his forearm with a smoke. And um, he's also got on his elbow, he's got a carving uh, that we carve into trees. And uh, you, know, you never know where your artwork's gonna go. And he said, oh, he said, Dubs, you, you've not got, you've got a, uh, a new fan. Um, uh, he said, yeah, I run into this fella at the, um, at the airport, um, 
you ran into this gentleman here. Uh, so I ran into Ice Cube and Ice Cube apparently said to him, uh, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I love your, love your tats, man. I love your artwork. And, um, so that's him on the right. Uh, um, uh, my mate there. Uh, now, so, yeah. speaking of unusual, um, or your artwork showing up in, um, uh, forms of art that we don't necessarily always call art. Um, there's a question from an audience member, um, Peppy, is there a medium you have yet to explore which interests you? Oh, oh, uh, hmm. um, uh, I, I, oh, I, I do think about glass, glass blowing, um, um, and, uh, actually, I think, you know, carving with wood, I think, um, and it's probably closer to, to my roots. I've actually got plans to carve a tree here on our property. Uh, that's a really good question. I, um, yeah, no one's ever asked me that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, because you, you dabble in lots of different um, art forms, don't you? Um, you know, being an artist, or you want to, you know, that way you want to find where your center is. And um, you know, I like I like dabbling. Uh, and I, I, I often joke with people when uh, I say, you know, when I retire or when I get older that I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm going to delve more into um, pottery. And I just want to get a potter's wheel um, because I love that time um, when I was in art school. And um, it's such a meditative, meditative time. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for that question. That's cool. Um, so yeah, uh, you never know where it's going to go. Okay, now, uh, now so I I like to say when I talk to um, when I teach kids, um, which I do a lot of um, around the country, I um, talk about the, the the long game. So um, having plans, you know, like a two year plan, a five year plan, uh, maybe a ten year plan. Uh, and because we, as illustrators, we often, um, we work in yearly blocks. So it's sort of, some people do, you know, uh, three books a year. Um, like I had three books out last year, but I, I generally work a bit slower than that. I like to sort of try and get at least one book out a year. Um, and so every time you sign a contract uh, or you're working on a, a new book, um, it's in your mind that it will come out the next year. And so I'm working on about six books at the moment. Uh, and so that will take me up to, you know, 2024, 2025, um, just from a publishing standpoint. Um, and that's not including all the other work that you're doing on, on, uh, on top and in tandem with that. So, so one of the projects that I am working on is a 21 year project. Uh, now it is, um, it's a, a gift for my daughter's 21st birthday. So after she was born, I started doing drawings of her. Um, I was doing one a day and now I've just spread them out. So I'm going to, I'm just basically detailing her life. Um, as she's growing up there. So, and she doesn't know that this book exists. So, I don't, I, I don't publish a lot of this online and just in case she sees it. So, um, and there you can see yeah, first day of school growing up. So, it, and so the last, um, you know, so it'll be, it's a 21 year project. It was going to be an 18, um, on her 18th birthday, but I'll go till she's 21. So the last drawing I'll do on her birthday, and I think I will get her to sit for it in person. Um, so yeah, here's another one where she's um, <laughs> she's having the day off from school here. This is a couple of years ago. Um, she was sick. Um, there she is there. Um, so now, yeah, recent publications. Um, 
So you may or may not know, but sorry, Day. Um, and this is such a, an honor to work on this book. Uh, you know, as an illustrator, these books don't come along often where you're actually illustrating the history of your country. Um, and uh, I cried when I was illustrating this book, just researching this book. Um, there's a lot of negativity out there still about Aboriginal people. Um, so that would drive me to um, do the best that I could on this book. Um, uh, so much so that I actually won the book of the year and I got a gold medal that I have here from it. So thank you, negative people. Uh, you've just made something positive. Uh, now, here's some of the images. And there they are on display at the Kligaroo at the moment. Now, these, uh, these are what's called the end papers of a book. So they're basically at the start and the finish of any book that you illustrate, any picture book. So they're a snapshot um, of, of what the book is about. Now, in Australia, there were two, you know, lots of, you know, um, homes for Aboriginal people where um, the kids were taken away or put into these homes, often hundreds of miles away from their traditional country, from their families. Um, and two of those, or one, uh, were infamous one, was the Kudamundra Girls' Home, out at a place called Kudamundra, and New South Wales, Melbourne, New South Wales. Um, uh, so all girls here, um, and it's a com com composite of, um, you know, all from all these photos and all the little pieces of paper down the bottom that I've illustrated, that they are from my own adoption file, which I um, did not know existed. Because um, when you are what's called a ward of the state, you are the property of the state and they have these records of you. And uh, of course, one of those records, they talked about me being uh, not markedly Aboriginal looking in appearance, but darkish, hence the term of the exhibition. So, and here is the other um, end paper. And one of the other homes was uh, the Kinchilla Boys Home. Um, and apparently some of those, um, those boys died there. Um, and this, they used that, they, there's a tree there where they used to chain the boys up. Uh, and I think the chain is still there on the tree. So they would chain the boys up and leave them there for days. And I had the honour of meeting some of those um, boys who were grown men. Um, and you can see the effect that it had on them. And one of them was uh, a beautiful man called Uncle Roy, uh, who's no longer with us. and. Uh, I was in a music um, course with him just after I um, stopped being an animator. Um, and he, uh, when he was out there um, at Kinsella, he looked through one of the buildings and he could, see, he could hear this sound and he looked through the window. And uh, there was a nun, said, it was all run by um, nuns. There was a nun and she was teaching one of the, the um, the boss's daughters to play piano and he fell in love with the piano and he snuck in one day um, through the window and started playing the piano and he got caught and uh, and of course and then the nun gave him what's called the cuts she wrapped him over the knuckles um, with a ruler he said his hands were really really sore for a long time after that um, but it didn't deter him from learning the piano and he Cop, he would draw the piano in the dirt and then he would practice. And he was such a great player. And uh, he used to, you know, he used to sing songs like My Way, Frank Sinatra, and, um, and you know, he played a little bit like Ray Charles. Beautiful, you know. Um, so those end papers, um, I did that to honor, um, you know, those followers. Um, they deserve that recognition and for that still story to be heard. Um, there's some more, basically, 
uh, yeah, Jace, uh, my daughter actually posed um, for one of the kids in this, this illustration. She's the one down the bottom left hiding her face there. Um, it's all in coffee, um, the, these browns. So I paint with coffee um, and salt sometimes, which uh, gives you a really cool texture. And, and if you were there in person, you can see those works and you can see the effect that the salt has on the work when you you basically you paint the coffee on um, and when it's still wet you sprinkle salt over and then you let it dry and you never know what you're going to get um, um, the end result and then you draw back into it uh, and so yeah and you know one of the other important things is you know when you illustrate books is that you don't um, you know, you try to, to steer away from illustrating things like um, guns and um, a lot of violent stuff, but you don't, you want to make sure that you still sort of stay true to any story, especially if it's a true story. Um, uh, and, you know, you don't want um, kids to sort of identify um, if, you've, if you're portraying, you know, some uh, evil characters, uh, like for instance, these men, um, you don't. You want them to be very powerful in the picture, but you don't want to um, show their faces. So children sort of see one face and go, "Oh, I'm afraid of that," um, um, because it can affect children. So there's a you know a lot of psychology that goes into illustrating. It's not just about drawing pretty pictures. Um, you know, it's it is a. You know, a, it, it is a response. There's a responsibility there. Um, now, this this one here was, uh, uh, yeah, you know, th this is after the children had been found, and I wanted to bring an element of Aboriginal tracking, but also tracking that people can see. So we can see that the men have got them surrounded, and the kids are there, and they don't know what to go, and they're a bit muddled up. Um, but if you, you can you note, there are, I've put five um, things called cattails. Um, they're bulrushes um, in here, and there's five children in the story. Um, so they have become the proxy children. Um, and so they're crushed and battered and um, dishevelled. Um, and the one on the bottom right is the seeds have been scattered. You know, so the scattering of, um, and the, the original version of this was I actually had children running toward you through the, through the mud, through this river, and splashing up towards the, the reader. And there's a, a man chasing them, and he's got his hand reached out, and it's sort of cut off here. Um, and the, you know, the, the central um, child is crying, and um, we had a, discussion about it saying it's too violent but we need it to be still you know still have that seriousness and that respect so this was the alternative that I came up with which I think still has that um, ominous um, uh, essence about it um, this is at the end of the book sorry day uh, and this took me it was a long time it was a big big uh, image um, and I'm quite proud of this one. And there's a photo in the centre there. That's I've, I've featured um, uh, Mum in there. So uh, and just uh, just detailing other um, other books. Uh, Black Cock Two, of course. This one, um, and it's just all the images. All these illustrations were drawn on black paper. So I was drawing in reverse. Which is it's really rewarding. Um, another book called Rocky and Louie, uh, tale of two brothers. Um, one leaves to the city, um, and uh, Louie, he's um, the, the younger brother. He doesn't know what to do with himself. So uh, here's some images from that book. And I've actually um, the lady in the yellow shirt, the mustardy sort of yellow. That's mum. 
and I've taken this from a reference photo when I met my family and all my aunts are around me fussing around me so I've just you know changed their faces but the and the um but I've kept the poses there and this is all done in watercolor and of course strangers on country which is uh this is like the one of the books that you want to work on as an illustrator because uh, it's it's history uh, Australian history it's really important um, it's an educational tool uh, so basically uh, there's six stories in this book um, and they're true stories uh, about people that were shipwrecked off the coast of Australia some came from Ireland some from Scotland some from England um, and they were rescued and lived with Aboriginal people for many years. Um, now these are tales that aren't told, you know, it's a narrative that has been controlled. So it's, it's really empowering to be able to work on this work, work on these, these books. And um, this is published by the National Library of Australia. Um, now I just want to sort of touch on one of the things in this book. Um, and I'm portraying a character called, uh, uh, a person called Narcisse, Narcisse Pelletier. It was from France. He was a 14 year old cabin boy and their boat ran aground uh, about a thousand, thousand miles off the coast of Australia. And they, the crew um, and Narcisse, they um, escaped in a lifeboat and they sailed all that way through these islands and they also got attacked on the way from people living on these islands and he, for Narcisse, so he, he was hit in the head by a rock by um, one of the attacking parties. Um, um, but they made it all the way to Cape York, at the top of Australia. And then when they got to um, the, when they got to land, um, he, the, the captain and the rest of the crew, they abandoned him. So they don't know what happened to him. Or they don't know what happened to them. Um, but they left him and all he had was a tin cup. They had found some water and they drank all the water um, out of a little puddle. And he said, there's none, you know, you didn't leave anything for me. And they said, well, you stay here because the water will return. But of course it didn't, they gave him a tin cup and they took off. Um, he was found um, sometime after that by Aboriginal people. And he lived with them for 17 years. And we know all this because um, he survived and prospered and actually wrote it down. And so we have, we're lucky because we have this photo of Narcisse there on the left. Now you can see he's actually, yeah, I think it's about 34, 34, so he was in his 30s. Um, you can see he's been initiated. And so you can, you can imagine, you know, the knowledge that he had. Um, and, you know, he had his nose pierced, he had um, wooden earrings, um, and he had forgotten how to speak French. By that stage, he was only speaking Aboriginal languages. And remember that, um, you know, Aboriginal people were multilingual people. So we had to learn, um, you know, other mobs' languages. Um, and, uh, and then he was actually on the beach. He actually had a wife and he had children there um, in Cape York. And he was on the beach um, with his family and a boat from England came sailing by and they saw him and they tricked him onto this boat. Um, and they said, you know, they're offering gifts for trade. And then they took off and they, they, um, sailed all the way and they dropped they took him back to france um, i don't know how they knew that he was french um must have regained some language um see so they stole him and he became a bit of a curiosity over there so and you can see the, the smaller picture that's him after being in france and because we know his story because he wrote it down which is really cool and this you know this tale is more famous in um, France than it is here. Um, there's been comics, uh, and I'm not sure whether there's been a film about him, but there's been a lot of documentation of his story. And that's just one of the stories in the book. 
So, you know, and it sort of it changes the narrative because people are like, oh, no, it was often clashes or people just stayed away from Aboriginal people. Um, but sometimes, you know, there was love there. And, um, you know, so his descendants would it'd still have some descendants there up at Cape York. Um, uh, so, yeah. Some of you who are local um, works from strangers on country are on view at Kulgiwi right now too. And we have the books here as well, both Sorry Day and Strangers on Country. So if you're interested in reading those or um, learning more about them, you can come on over to Kulgiwi, make a reservation to visit. <laughs> yeah, please, please go and um, go and see them. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely proud of all those works there. Uh, it's, yeah, it was like, it's a dream, dream to work on the, those books. Uh, and it's an important, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a children's companion, Strangers on Country, to um, the adult version called Living with the Locals, which has, um, I think it's 20 or tw 12 um, of those, you know, tales of similar vein, you know, true stories, uh, which people don't often know about. Um, so, uh, current book, current books out. This one actually came out last year, um, Bindi, and it deals with. Um, we had a lot of bushfires here in Australia last last year, and then we went uh, straight into COVID. <laughs> um, and so there's uh, a lot of countries and a lot of bushfires around where we are here on the Central Coast. Um, and so this sort of details. Um, this is a, a, a book of verse written by uh, one of our great Aboriginal authors, Cur Curly Saunders. Um, that one available here too. So, so. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's a standalone book because it's, uh, you don't often see um, these poetry books. Um, and it's the first um, book of poetry that I've illustrated. Um, and to echo the, the narrative of this bushfire in the background, um, I've drawn them in lead and in charcoal pencil. Uh, let's see, here's some of the um, um, images from the book. They're not the best photographs, they actually look better in the book. Um, and I've used a twig as a clock. So this is before the fire, during the fire, and after there's regrowth. Yeah, so. Uh, and now here's one, this is uh, what I'm working on currently. Um, it's also written by Curly Saunders, and this has been in the works for quite some time. Um, called Our Dreaming, and it's, it's, uh, the main characters are two echidnas, which we call Biggie Bella um, in Big More language. And it's a mother and um, her child, and she's taking them through the landscape. So this is in, the early stages and I'm just starting on the final art um, presently. So um, yeah, they meet all lots of different uh, uh, life and uh, traveling through lots of different um, areas of Australia and just talking about, uh, it's, a, it's a spiritual children's book, which is a, it's a really interesting concept. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge to illustrate uh, um, as in somewhat abstract um, concepts in a realistic way. So here's some of the concept work from that. And uh, this is uh, what I'm working on at the moment, Once It Was a Girl. So this is like the very, one of the very first concept images of uh, Once It Was a Girl. So... Uh, Which will be uh, a very exciting sequel. Yes, um, um, and you know, it's, it's taken, uh, so this is 10 years since um, Once It Was A Boy came out. Um, so I will stop sharing there, and there you go. Well, thank you so, so much, Deb. This has been wonderful. Um, I think everyone- oh, thank, you, thank you very much, um, yeah. Unless there are any questions that come in, in the next few seconds, uh, we are so grateful for um, all the things that you shared with us today. Such a, just some wonderful stories. And it's really great to just sort of see 
how all these life experiences um, in your early years have sort of resulted in um, where you are today and where you're going. So we're really excited that Kluge Roo gets to be part of that journey. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome, Lauren. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, I still can't believe that, you know, I mean, exhibiting at the Kluge Roo. That's amazing. <laughs>